So I'm delighted to introduce our next company, Zoo Digital, and the CEO and co-founder, Stuart Green of Zoo Digital, another one of our Yorkshire T20 positions. Now, Zoo Digital is the world leader in cloud-based services for the media and movie industry. Now, Stuart has seen Zoo Digital transform, or pivot as we say nowadays, from our video games and software for the DVD industry into today a world leader in localization and media services. Now, the pandemic has provided Zoo with an environment to showcase their technology, counting Disney and many of the media giants in, in its customer base. So welcome, Stuart. And maybe you can start by explaining to the audience what Zoo Digital actually does, please. Thanks for the introduction, Duncan. Uh, yes, so we're, as you've said, we're, we're a Sheffield headquartered business and we provide services into the entertainment industry. Our clients are large producers of feature films and TV series, as well as a number of the uh, global streaming video services that, that operate uh, these days. And what we do for them is we take the original content that they produce, so maybe a, 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 you know, a, a, a TV series in multiple episodes, and we do everything that's necessary to those original materials so that they, they can then be viewed through a streaming service all around the world. And there are, there are two major components of that that you see on this slide that uh, Duncan's kindly put up. Uh, the first of which is, um, is referred to as localization. So obviously adapting into different languages. And in the entertainment industry, there are sort of two methods that are used there. Um, subtitling, which I'm sure all your listeners will be familiar with when you see text overlaid on the screen, if you hear someone speaking in a different language. Um, a, a less common approach used in this country is dubbing. And in dubbing, what's done is that the, the original voices of the screen actors are in effect removed from the programme and are replaced with voice actors who are essentially speaking an adaptation of the script into a different language. And the reason we don't often come across that in this country is that as um, culturally, uh, as a nation, we tend to prefer subtitling as the way in which we consume foreign language programs. Um, but that's not true of every country. And in fact, uh, major European countries such as France, Germany, Italy, Spain have a long tradition of dubbing. So if you were, if you were living in France and, and watching TV there or watching you know, a streaming service there, uh, content that is, uh, is in original language English, you would typically consume with a dubbed soundtrack. Um, and you, know, you would hear in France, you would hear French voices speaking the parts. And that's, you know, that, that is the norm in, in, in those countries. Um, and the, the choice between subtitle and dubbing is something that varies uh, around the world. The reason it's, it's worth uh, just elaborating that a little bit is that when you look at how much money is spent in the industry on localization for media, uh, the vast majority, about 70% of it, is actually on dubbing, uh, which often comes as a surprise to uh, British audiences who are, who are just not used to, uh, used to um, encountering dubbing. So localization is one big piece of the work that we do. And the other big piece is what we refer to as media services. And it's to do with, that's more to do with getting the, the materials in the right technical formats and combined in the right ways so that they are compatible with a particular streaming service to which they're being delivered. So, uh, you know, Netflix has a particular way of doing things uh, that is unique to, to that company. Um, Amazon does it a different way. Disney does it another way too. So, so we have to, depending on where the content is going, we have to do certain preparatory work on the materials in order to get them in, into the right format. And um, as I said, we do this for major um, uh, studios, uh, producers of content, as well as the streaming services themselves. And the key part of our strategy uh, that sets us apart in the market is that we do all of this using proprietary software that we have created and which gives us competitive advantage. So just to give you an, an, an overview of the business then, um, we've got a very clear and differentiated strategy for growth because we have made this and continue to make an ongoing investment in R&D to create proprietary software that brings for us significant competitive advantage. We're focused on a high value 
and growth market. So media localization is part of a much bigger localization industry, but it's a it's a very high value niche and is one of the largest segments of that uh, of that global industry. And um, as I said, the the buyers in that industry are um, are, are typically um, movie studios, you know, program makers, streaming services, um, most of whom are already our customers. So we already have an established strong customer base amongst the biggest players in the industry. We're growing very rapidly. Um, so we, we put out announcement a few weeks ago to inform the market that our revenues for this year, the, the uh, year ended March 21, will be ahead of, uh, of market expectations. Um, which would result in a growth of about 27% year on year. So, so last year, we, our, t our sales were about $30 million and we've indicated that they will be at least $38 million in the current financial year. And um, as a business, we are, we're still very much in um, investment mode because there is a huge market to go after. Right now, we have a relatively small market share but a strategy that is delivering strong growth and where we believe you know a few years from now we can be one of the largest players um, in this industry also with us today ralph atkinson a student and investor from the university of sheffield so ralph if you'd like to go ahead with your question please thank you duncan so um consumption of film and television services has been accelerated by lockdown uh, do you think that that change of consumer behavior will remain in a post-lockdown world Okay, well, um, perhaps I should start by saying uh, and just clarifying that our, our clients are basically the producers of that content. So, um, so the number of subscribers doesn't directly impact Zoo, it's a, it has an indirect uh, relationship. Um, and what we have seen during lockdown is the customers that we serve have become, uh, you know, have grown very significantly during this period. And I think for the, you know, you, you, you allude to that, Ralph, that um, that during, in effect, if you think about streaming video services or, you know, just watch, watching TV, you know, watching TV is a, is a leisure activity. And therefore as an activity, it competes with all the other things that we would do in our, in our leisure time. And, and given these periods of lockdown, that has taken away certain opportunities that obviously we would choose to pursue, you know, meeting with friends, going down the pub or you know, going to the cinema. Um, we can't do those things at the moment. And that creates more available time and that many consumers have filled that time with, with watching streaming services and watching box sets on, on Netflix and, and Disney Plus and so on. There are some quite interesting stats that have been published about what has happened during um, the, the period of the pandemic. Um, There's one survey that was done by Erson Young, who measured that the, the average number of different streaming services um, taken by consumers, and I think this is probably in the US, was about 3.4 before the pandemic. So, you know, that's people maybe taking, uh, you know, a Netflix, um, uh, Amazon, Hulu, and, you know, and something else. Um, and that number has increased to 4.2. So it's increased by over 20% uh, during the period of the pandemic. And so what you're seeing is consumers actually trying out different services, which is quite, so it's, it's not just them consuming more of their Netflix subscription, it's them actually buying into multiple services. And I think that's an interesting um, trend uh, in the market. I'm sure that once we all get more free time back, so for some people, well, for most of us, that probably will mean we will watch less of this of these streaming services. But the question is whether people will discontinue their subscriptions to these different services. And I think where another interesting stat, uh, stat that came out of that Earth and Young research was that the um, households that contain children um, have a, have increased their number of services significantly. And I think my guess is lots of them have taken up Disney Plus. And um, that's, that's also a very kind of interesting scenario because you imagine that children have perhaps become used to watching, you know, Disney's service, streaming video service. That would be quite a hard one to turn off, I would imagine, for most parents once, they, uh, once the pandemic is over. So, so my guess is that there will be, inevitably, there's going to be some um, scaling back. But this market is on a phenomenal growth. And of course, much of that growth is coming from international um, expansion in countries that have hitherto not had a high penetration of these kinds of services. But if you, if you look at India, for example, the number of 
consumers in India who have access to um, either 3G type services or, or broadband services has been growing very rapidly. And that, of course, um, enables more people to enjoy uh, and subscribe to these, these kinds of streaming services. So there's been um, you know, a very marked ongoing growth, which has undoubtedly been accelerated by the pandemic. But my guess is that once the pandemic is over, we, we'll maybe see a, you know, maybe a kind of a leveling up of growth as, as there is a, perhaps a high level of attrition and churn in the market before that growth resumes. I, you know, I think fundamentally, I think, you know, streaming services is the future of home entertainment. It, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's here now and it's only going to continue to grow whilst there are markets where, you know, currently penetration is, um, is relatively low. That's true. What you're saying to me is, as someone who has a young family, I need to cut my subscription services before it becomes too important for the children. <laughs> I won't put it quite like that, but uh, you know, I'll let you. I'll let you make your own decisions about that. Okay, that's very kind. So, also, Stuart, where does Zoo Digital see themselves in three years' time? You know, we've recently seen some ambitious targets out there of, you know, of a hundred million revenue potential. So can you explain to the audience, you know, where you see Zoo Digital in three years time? And perhaps also, you know, not just from a revenue perspective, but also how you see the, the industry changing. You know, we can all make guesses, but you are very clearly in the industry. Yeah. OK, well, we are um, in our industry. There are you know, the kind of things that we do, particularly in the, in the area of localization, there are, there are actually lots of companies, you know, hundreds, possibly thousands of companies around the world that provide some element of media localization type services. But most of them do that on a local basis. So they're, you know, they may be based in, in, in Paris and they basically dub programs from primarily English into French. And that's what they do. So, so they don't offer that service across other languages and they don't offer maybe other services such as subtitling and the media services that we offer. So of those hundreds or possibly thousands of companies who do that around the world, there's actually a very small number that can firstly offer those services across pretty much any language. And secondly, provide an end-to-end -end service capability. That's to say the localization, both subtitling and dubbing, as well as, as these media services. So, so we're one of a, a very small number of companies in our industry serving major media organisations that ha with the capability to deliver the services that, that they require. So that's the first thing. And uh, if you look at the biggest players in our sector, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, they were delivering sales of, you know, around two or three of them around $200 million annually. And we are, you know, last year we delivered sales of of around 30 million and, and that will increase to at least 38 million in, in the current year. So, so obviously we're, we're a good way away from them at the moment, but given our differentiated strategy and the benefits that we can deliver to our clients, we believe that there's, there's, you know, there's every reason to believe that we can become one of the largest uh, and most prolific players in our industry. And, um, and indeed, as, as you mentioned, Duncan, we've already uh, told our investors that in the medium term we're targeting a hundred million dollars of sales which obviously is a is a big step up from where we are at the moment but we can see a very clear path to get to that point and we can do that because we already have um, all of these almost all of these major players in the industry as customers and for us it's really about um, winning a larger proportion of their spend and one of the most significant achievements in our you know, recent evolution as a business was um, a couple of years ago when we were selected by a major media company to be one of, uh, one of their uh, pr uh, sort of premier providers of these services, which has led to a significant uplift in, in revenues that we've achieved. And we believe that you know, we can continue to grow our business with that client as well as with other clients in order to achieve that hundred million dollars without having to, you know, we think a hundred million dollars is achievable even without having to win any significant new uh, additional clients. I, th I think finally, just, just to, to wrap up on this, I think one of the biggest trends that we're seeing um, in the industry that is pertinent uh, to 
in thinking about zoo as an investment opportunity is that more and more of the participants in entertainment are shifting to what is referred to in the industry as a day and date release model for their content. So you remember, you know, years ago before streaming services, uh, TV, TV series used to come out one episode at a time, you know, once a week. So you'd see an episode each week. And indeed, obviously, some uh, sort of broadcasters still still operate that model. Um, so what that means is that um, that you know if you're if you're preparing those products to release internationally, you've got you know you've you've got a stage delivery of products, and and therefore you can get them ready for international distribution uh, over a prolonged period. But of course, that that really has fallen away in in this era of streaming, and all episodes are released at the same time. So that means you've got to condense work that used to happen over several weeks into you know, a very short period of time in order to get all episodes ready uh, to go out on your platform. And, and you've got to do that across every language into which you're, you're providing that content to consumers. So there is an enormous amount of work that has to be done to take a program like an episodic TV series and get it ready with all the subtitles and all the dubbed audio for all of these languages so that they're all ready to go on the same day. So that's, that, as I said, that's referred to in the industry as day and date release. It means all versions in all formats and all languages pretty much on the same day. And that brings with it enormous strain in the traditional supply chain in our sector. And as I, I touched on earlier, what sets us apart in our industry is that we are technology enabled. We are basically leading the digital transformation of our sector by using technology, purpose-built technology created by us and our R&D team here in Sheffield to, to transform the way in which this kind of work is done. And what that means is that we have much more scalability in what we do. Uh, we can process uh, much more content in any language in a very efficient way and therefore respond to this enormous demand that's coming from our industry in a very elegant, uh, uh, with a very elegant approach. And what we think that will lead to is a situation where we will win market share from, uh, from other players in the market who are constrained by the physicality of their operations. So they are basically, our competitors are mainly bricks and mortar businesses you know, with facilities in lots of different countries uh, who are, you know, fundamentally constrained by essentially how many recording rooms, for example, they happen to have in their facility. And because of the way in which we virtualize this process with our cloud software, we don't have that constraint. And therefore we can, um, we can expand and continue to grow without adding lots of um, cost base, without adding lots of capital infrastructure, and without having to open and own and operate lots of facilities around the world. So, um, so in a nutshell, I think, you know, your question three years from now, I think we'll be a whole lot bigger than we are uh, now, and we will be continuing to lead the charge in this digital transformation of our sector and, um, and securing more business because we are basically built for the requirements of today's entertainment industry, whereas our competitors are really built for, you know, the, the, the industry of yesteryear. Stuart, I'd like to thank you, you know, in, for introducing Zoo Digital, clearly another world leader based in Yorkshire. And Ralph, I'd also like to thank you very much today for your questions. And thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.